Hey, Wire Monkeys, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Cabling. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, estimators, project managers, ICT personnel, even customers. We're connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube and you like this content, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're watching us on one of the audio podcast platforms like Stitcher or Apple or Google, would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? Those simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the ICT industry. Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? I do a live stream on TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, of course that's me, your favorite questions on installation, certification, estimation, project management, even career path questions. But I can hear you now, but Chuck, I'm driving my truck at 6 p.m. on a Thursday. I don't want to get into an accident. Not a problem. They're recorded, and you can watch those shows at your convenience. You can find them at letstalkcabling.com. And finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you value this content, would you mind hitting on the QR code right there? You, you can send me a cup of coffee. You can make a donation to the podcast studio. You can even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me, after hours, of course. And there's also other ways you can support the channel via, like, uh, Amazon if you go through the Let's Talk Cabling page. And we're always looking for corporate sponsorship. So if your company's core values are educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the industry, reach out to me on one of the social media platforms. Help join the, the team to make this industry a little bit better. So today we're talking about wireless surveys. And, you know, it's one of those funny things because customers don't understand wireless. They think, oh, it's wireless. It doesn't need any cables. Yes, it does. You still got to run cable to those wireless access points. But those wireless access points get affected by the environment that surrounds them. They lose signal when they go through walls. They lose signal when they go through people. They lose signal when they go through glass. That's why it's important to do a wireless survey. Now, how do you do a wireless survey? What tool should you use? Well, I've got just the guest for you. I came across this individual at uh, an event just a couple weeks ago. He's a fellow instructor. And, you know, as an instructor myself, it takes a lot to impress me as an instructor. Not that I'm so great, but I'm very critical of other instructors. This guy's absolutely fantastic. He is a wealth of knowledge. So let's bring him on and let's talk about wireless surveys, what tools you should use, and what things you need to consider. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Um, for those people who may not know you, who are you and why should we listen to you? My name is Dan Critch and I am with Cable and Connections and I have been selling tools for over 25 years and uh, I'm a specialist on networking tools, wireless tools, fiber, copper, and uh, that's what I've been, I train people how to use them and I support them as they, if they have any issues and problems. So I know all about these tools that low voltage contractors use. Long time no see. It's been, what, a whole week and a half, two weeks, something like that? Yeah, we were at the Tech Fest together uh, helping Tech, out. Techsgiving. Tech, 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 tech Giving, right. yes. Yes, so I became aware of you at Tech Giving. You probably Tech Fest too, but that was my first event, so I was kind of overwhelmed. So I, I'm, I've met a lot of people, and I couldn't even tell you half the people I met. So I probably met you at Tech Fest too. Yeah. But, but uh, I got to sit in your training session. I mean, I, I, as from one instructor to another instructor, let me just tell you, you are top notch, absolutely top notch. Yeah, as an instructor, and you probably do this yourself. When I sit in other people's classes, I'm actually there taking two classes, right? The content that you're delivering, and then I'm also watching the instructor to see what are they doing really good that I can take back and use in my classes, right? Do you do the same thing? Yeah, I do. I see what how I can. Uh help people learn about these tools that we sell. And I sell lots of different products. And so if they have a different way of presenting or a different uh, way of reaching the people, it just helps me sell the product even more and train them how to use it. Absolutely. So today I'm going to talk about 
wireless site surveys, right? And, you know, you know, wireless, the thing that, that needs wires that people, you know, always joke about, you know, well, let's just put wireless everywhere. Well, wireless has a lot of nuances to it, and it's something that a low voltage contractor who's currently doing cabling can easily do, but there are some things that they've got to learn, some things they've got to do. Um, so first, can you start off telling us what exactly is a wireless site survey and why would that be important to a low voltage tech? So wireless site survey is when you're deploying access points and you want to know what the coverage is. So uh, it's changed a lot over the years, but uh, I used to carry a laptop around. Now we have these little tools and you would walk around after you deploy the access point, say the ubiquity, uh, and you want to know what the coverage is. And why is it important? So like behind me, you know, I have my green screen. This is material that signal penetrates very well. But what if it's cement walls? You lose about 12 dB through cement, uh, glass, uh, 3 dB, uh, elevator shaft. It's like almost kills the entire signal. So each building's unique, right? And so we're putting up these access points and we're thinking coverage will go through these walls and the different mediums. And a lot of times it doesn't. So you have to get multiple access points to, to make good coverage in these buildings. Like a school, uh, schools are horrible. They're built like a bunker and uh, you need access points in the hallway, you need access points in the classroom. And so with the sur site survey, when you're walking around with these tools, uh, it's gonna tell you where you have good coverage, bad coverage, interference, right? And it puts it on a floor plan and it shows you that coverage so you can easily tell the customer what's going on, right? And there's there's a couple of, there's, there's the theoretical site survey and there, the real-time site survey, which we're gonna talk about today, but the theoretical one is you can be at your computer and have a special software on your computer and you put the floor plan in and you draw the walls in or you tell it what the walls are made out of and then you can estimate how many access points you need, uh, but it's an estimate and it doesn't, it's not always right. So the real-time site survey is the better tool uh, to verify what your coverage really is gonna be. So you said that, that you, would, you would do this after you install the access points. Yes. Why would you not want to survey before you put in the access points so that way you don't have to move access points if you find that there's a coverage area that's not good? So, well, you're saying there's certain, there has to be access points in there to do the survey, right? So, well, don't, don't, so don't, don't, and, and look, you're the wireless expert, not me. Uh, so I'll default to your judgment here. But if, if I was doing a, if a customer came to me and said, look, uh, I want to put wireless in, right? And and I didn't know that I didn't know all the DB losses that you just mentioned. I'm kind of new doing wireless. I might just take a a wireless access point, put it like maybe on a a, a tripod, and then just put it where I think I want to put the access point, and then do measurements on that. And then that way I don't have to move it after I install it. That's the old school method was actually some guy had a stick and they would walk around and do a survey that way. Um, really and. You, you, you have to have access points in there to do a, a survey. If there's nothing there, there's no signal to read. But um, you know, if you wanted to put a couple access points up and then take some readings, you could do that as well. I, you know, because you it's line of sight a lot of times with these access points. Depending what you get, Ubiquity has, uh, or Cisco, or whoever you're going to be using. Aruba, uh, they have different antennas you got to put on, different power settings. How high is it going to be? And that all affects the the way the signal is broadcast in the environment, right? So in that theoretical survey we said earlier, you can put all that detail in, the type of antennas that's being used, the height it's being put up on the wall, and the antennas you're using, if it's directional or is it a, you know, a you know an AMI, whatever it is, lots of different options for you. Um, and then you, can, but again, it's a, it's an estimate with the software. It's it's it gets close. You get it, you know, how many X points you need but there's nothing that will replace doing a real-time survey. Yeah, nothing beats real-time data. I mean, it's kind of like when you look at fiber optic testing, right? The OTDR is, is really just calculating the loss, but an optical loss test set is measuring the actual yes. loss. Yes. It's the same kind of thing with the theoretical would be like the, the OTDR doing, measuring what it thinks it would be. But you, like you said, you, know, you might have a wall there, and it might seem like it's a gypsum board wall, but if it's like an old landmark, you never know. There might be, there might be that wire mesh behind that wall, which I'd imagine that would kill the signal a little bit more yes, than, a, yes. than a regular gypsum board wall. Yes, definitely. Right. Metal is definitely a, a problem. In newer construction, they're using metal. It'll definitely reflect the signal. Some types of lining on glass too, water. So if you do a survey and there's no people there, it, 
and then you do a survey with people, people absorb signal and that can adjust or change your survey as well. Oh, I never even thought about that, yeah. about people. people. I, that makes absolute sense because, um, uh, you know, the church I, I used to go to a long time ago, I was on the tech team and it never fail. We'd have the audio set up perfect during practice, but as soon as you put bodies in the room, it affected the audio. Right. I never thought about that affecting wireless signals. You're absolutely right because we're filled with water. We're filled with water right? and water absorbs the signal. I, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. See, I learned something new today. Yes. That's why I said you're a great instructor. Yeah, you're a great instructor. Um, so when you said the, the, the DB laws, you know, what, if, just, what would be a good DB range for an access point to be working? What, what kind of numbers should, should the tech be looking for? So, uh, so like a negative, it's in the negative, so negative DB. So negative five, let's say, you're like touching that access point. You're right there. Uh, and then as you get low, you know, a negative 100 is far away. Right, so those are your your different ranges. So we want to be and again. Um, I want to say negative. What I see in negative thirty, negative forty, negative fifty. Uh, you in those ranges there, you have good signals. Now, if we're doing high speed stuff. We're talking Wi-Fi six E speeds, you know, which I just had installed in our office. Uh, we're getting like over a hundred to two hundred uh, meg transfers here uh, compared to with older. B and G stuff, which you're doing maybe 20 to 50 in your speeds, um, you know, you want to have good signal strength. If you don't have good signal strength, it's going to cause problems. You, you you get more retries, you don't have a strong enough signal, and you have a lot of retries, it slows the network down, right? And that can also, we didn't even talk about noise yet. Uh, lots of different noise emitters out there too. Uh, microwave ovens. So uh, I'm in my home office now, and upstairs we have a microwave. We turn that microwave on. Uh, it'll come up and be shown on these devices. Well, microwave is there and it's, it kills the signal a lot of times, right? It slows my performance down. Uh, but microwaves, Bluetooth devices, cordless phones, spy cameras, gaming consoles like Xbox and PlayStation, wireless security systems, jammers um, that you can, you know, you're not, not that you're going to buy a jammer on purpose, but people do buy jammers and cause problems. Right. Uh, spy cameras are really bad too. And they all can affect the performance of the wireless network. Now, these devices, like this one here, will show that type of stuff. It'll say, oh, microwave is running. It shows you the duty cycle. It'll show you the channels it's affecting. And uh, it's intermittent, though. The noise is not always on. Right. So what's right. nice about these tools, um, they could be left running for hours looking for these noise emitters, which is great. You already answered my next question. I was just going to ask you, is there a way that you could leave it there to, to, to catch those intermittent signals? And, and when, you, when you said the cameras, I, I've got... I've got blink wireless cameras literally surrounding my house. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because we have a farm. So I would imagine that that would, that would affect a wireless survey. Right? Yes. So what are some of the key objectives that a, a technician is going to be trying to achieve with that wireless survey? All right. So when doing a wireless survey uh, with a handheld tool like this, this is the AirCheck from uh, Net Alley, and this is the third generation one. I've been selling them from the beginning when it was Fluke, right? And they sold it off now, and Net Alley owns this. So what you want to do is you put the floor plan in, which I can actually want to share my screen, okay? So absolutely, do that. let's do that. Let me go to share screen. You should see on your screen the uh, the, the Net Alley tool that we're talking right. about. Yep. Uh, and it has this it has this air mapper feature, which I'm going to click. And now you see a floor plan. So the floor plan, uh, it could be entered in. Uh, you, uh, it could be a AutoCAD. It could be a picture. You could draw it in, a, in some app and then put it in. So you, it's just something to give reference. And then there is some actual additional settings where you put in scale, so it knows how big this drawing is. Uh, okay. But what what we do here, when you start the server, you're going to tell it where you're starting. So I'm going to hit start. And I'm just take my finger and hit that cubicle there, and I get a circle. So what you want to do, wherever you're starting the building, is you, you tell it where you are, and you hit that area, and then walk to the edge of the circle. And when it turns green, then you hit another area. I'm going to do this quickly. You, you cannot do this quickly in real life when doing a survey. You're going to walk very slowly through the environment, all right? But I just want to show you, highlight, I'm putting these circles in. And you're going to cover the whole floor with circles. Hopefully, you can see that on your screen. Yep. And 
what you're doing, it's scanning all the channels that are available for Wi-Fi, all right, as mm -hmm. you're walking through this environment. And uh, there's no GPS, right, in the building. So that's why I'm telling it where I'm going through the environment. And once you've covered the whole floor, right, you cover this whole floor plan, which is going to take you hours. And you can't do it in just 30 minutes unless it's a tiny space. But something this big is going to take you, I, I would think, a couple hours. Then it's it's going to be able to give you that heat map and showing you where you get good signal, bad signal interference, and so on. So, uh, Mike, the competitors out there, um, uh, that, that I don't think they're as easy as this product is. I, I, I sell the software, too. I've been selling that for 18 years. Air Magnet Surveyor Pro, which, was again, was Fluke, and now it's NetAlly. Way more complicated than this. Uh, you had to do a whole bunch of things before you got to this point. This is way simpler to use for a low voltage contractor. So they, they can add this, you know, they're, they're installing the cabling, they're installing the access points. Now they could do a survey, right? Anyone could use this product uh, to do this survey. And, and, it, and it, the, the cost is a lot less than buying a, a software that, you know, it's, the software is like five grand, five to six grand, plus you had to buy a, a good laptop or tablet let's say, mm -hmm. that was running right. Windows. This right. is, and there's licensing fees too with uh, software. My competitors, they charge heavy licensing fees. There's no licensing fee with this. When you buy the product, you buy this tool here, uh, it will, it's just, you You get the air mapper and you just start using it. You know, we would train oh, you how, how to use it. How much is that tool? All right, so you're talking list price for the air mapper, uh, excuse me, for the uh, air check. It's like forty five hundred bucks, forty five hundred. Okay. That's list, and that's a lifetime investment. That's not like you said a yearly, you know, you know, licensing fee like a lot of the software companies like to do nowadays. Yes. Now I will say this: you 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 should get the extended warranty. Anything new that comes out, you're covered. You, you know, you would be able to download that, and it'd be updated. Uh, and firmware too is covered. So if you, the extended warranty. Yes, yeah, you, you are paying a little bit each year for that. And I believe you can get a three-year uh, extended warranty on this, so you're not paying it every if you don't want to do that. But uh, it covers if it breaks, it's swapped out, any problems and any additional uh, features that come out for it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I will say one other thing too, there are additional features that they give you with the uh, extended warranty up in the cloud for filtering in these surveys. So if you want all the bells and whistles, then you would want the extended warranty for additional filtering in Link Live. You don't have to have it, but it, it's nicer to have all those extra features. So looking back at our screen where we got the, the, the floor plan, do you, do you yes. happen to know how many square feet that, that floor plan is that you've got there currently? No, I got, I actually got this from NetAlley Engineering because I said, give me a floor okay. plan. I was doing a meeting. So I didn't generate this floor plan on my own. Gotcha. But well, when I went through training, uh, the guy that originally made all the network testers for Fluke developed this product, right? And he did training. When, when they released it, they did this training and they took a picture of the, he went to Walmart and took a picture of that. There's like a map when you go in the Walmart for like exits yeah. and everything for yeah, fires. Yeah, yeah. And he right. used that for his survey and training all the, uh, all the salespeople, right? Okay. For this product. And you could just use a picture like that. And he walked around and it was, it was amazingly, there's a lots of uh, access points in in uh, Walmart. Also, a lot of Bluetooth. This can do Bluetooth site surveying as well. So yeah, we, I haven't run into it that much, but for a lot of stores, they use Bluetooth, and so this can do that as well. Yeah, I used to do that a lot with when I when I used to be an estimator. If the customer didn't have a floor plan, all you do is find the fire evacuation floor plan, and then I I, I would this is back before everybody had you know, smartphones on them all the time. So I would take that, go take it to the, to the Xerox machine, copy it, put the original one back on. I used to use that as my floor plan to do the estimate with it. So that's actually, you know, that's a great idea that you can take that, input it into this device, and then do your survey based on that device. That's pretty slick. Yeah. So, now, so after you've done the floor and you've done all your green circles, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the, what's the next step? Oh, so you would upload it to Link Live. So if I go back here, Go back to Air Mapper, up, and I hit stop. It and it has that little square box upper right corner, mm -hmm. and, and I can go and uh, I could save it locally. I could save it to the software that you could still the Surveyor Pro, 
but I, I could store it up to the cloud. So if I go, let me go share that screen. So this is Link Live, if I share it correctly. All right, do you see that? It says Link Live on your screen? It's coming up, there it is. Yes, it's up now. All right, all right. So this is the free uh, web portal where all the reports would go to, all right? And, um, and you would see the heat map here. Uh, also, what I, I have on this screen before I, I find the heat map, uh, it does topology. So I, I love showing this off. So after you did your survey, it actually will do a topology. I have everything's connected on the wireless network too. So that's sweet. So uh, I could drill into it and look at these devices it found and, and show what access points they're hooked up to. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's part of this, you know, it, you, you did the survey, but this is extra, right? And you could drill into these devices and see more on these devices that you found during the survey. So, so is, it, is this what they call the heat map or is that a different map? It's it's topology. This is not the heat map. Let me find. Okay. All right. You should see a floor plan. Yes. With blue all circles. Right. Good. So I have just turned on all these options here. Um, let's just make it simpler. I'll turn all these. So let's show path. So you see the arrows as you're yes. walking, it shows the direction the technician was walking. And again, you're going to walk very slow and go in each cubicle, go in each room. Uh, this was just a little one, they st and they stopped it. Uh, and it gives you signal strength, shows the dimensions, all right, after you did your scale. And uh, heat map, so the circles uh, are showing signal, right, uh, signal strength. And I could sort by noise, signal-noise ratio, co-channel interference, adjacent channel interference transfer rates, things like that. So there's different ways I can look at stuff, right? So, so make sure I understand this, Dan. Anything inside that circle would mean that if I had a device, a wireless device, it would work. Is Anything that that within that circle, and it wasn't a full survey, right? It, it's showing what our, our signal strength is and what we're getting from the access point, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're getting signal, it should work. We're getting really strong signal, negative 19. So it, it is really good signal. Access point location too. After you did your survey, it'll show you where all the access points are. It locates them. So can you use this to figure out where to put the access points? So yes and no. So let me stop sharing a second. So okay. let me go back to you so I can see you. So you can put access points up and then see what your coverage is after doing it. And then you know if you need more, right? Um, so if you were trying, you know, for me, if I didn't want to spend the money on the theoretical survey software, that's what I would do. I would put access points up, see what my coverage is, and I don't have a good good enough coverage, then add more access points. If you want to be, if you want to do, the, if you want to save time, you could spend, it's a couple thousand dollars, the theoretical survey software, and get a better estimate where to place access points, then put them up, then you can come back with doing the real-time survey and see if that's correct and if you have to add any more. The smaller contractor is probably going to go with the first way. Put access points up, think, seeing where he thinks they will work, then walk around with a tool like this, and then if we don't have enough coverage, add more, because then he doesn't want to spend another $2,000 on application software, which he's going to have to pay licensing fees on top of that. Right. I would have to imagine that if somebody does wireless as one of their – one of, the, one of the things that they offer as a company, there's got to be some skill sets they built up from doing that. So they should be able to kind of, well, we should, I would think if they say we need a wireless access point there and one over in the kitchen and one over the hallway, that they're going to be probably 95% right. They might find a little little spot where they didn't think about because maybe there might have been, like I said, some, some unusual circumstance. But I would think most of the time, you have to do the survey, they're probably going to be adding very little if, they're, if their skills are doing wireless right. surveys. Now, believe it or not, you're supposed to do a survey a couple times a year in these buildings that you're oh, installing really? it because it's dynamic. Things change. I added a bookshelf here with paper. Paper is horrible. Add, it blocks signal, right? So when buildings, things move, things change, you should go, you know, offer doing another survey. That's you're charging billable time, walking, doing that survey. And it, do we still have the good coverage, right? So this is a residual service. Thing. Yes. Yeah. And that's nothing new. It's been like that forever. Most guys don't know about it or don't do it, right? And so it's recommended highly to do it, especially in hospitals too. Uh, oh, yeah. Like I deal a lot with Memorial Stone Kettering. 
uh, over the years. I sold them a lot of equipment and other hospitals, and they have all these wireless devices. Uh, and they come in, they take your temperature, they take your blood pressure, they do all these different things in different rooms. And that's all going up into their network. And a lot of times, uh, if we don't have good signal, it's not getting transferred over. Uh, or, or there's a problem, it's sticking to the access point all the way down the hall for some reason. I'm not getting out the data. Well, why is that, right? Well, we can verify these things. This actually can mimic uh, other devices. I could put the, uh, I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but uh, we can mimic like an iPhone 14 or a Samsung Note or uh, a, a medical device. So we could, it, and that you put those settings into this box and mimicking those devices. And we can see how we're transferring from one access point to the other, all right? And uh, if, if we're not working well, if we're sticking to access points down the, at the end of the hall, well, we have problems, right? Now, is that something most uh, contractors can fix? It's usually the IT guy, because he has to adjust settings in the network, right? Increase or decrease signal strength. Uh, but we can verify we have issues and problems and show them and give them reports. So this will save detailed reports. Would you use this to measure a wireless access point that let's say you're doing an office building somewhere, right? I'll use the Pentagon as an example, because I've done a lot of work in the Pentagon over the years. Okay. So in the very center of the Pentagon, there's, there used to be this cafe it used to be called ground zero cafe, but it's, I think it's gone now. Okay. But let's say that they want to have wireless people have access to their wireless devices in that courtyard. Yep. Right. Because you mentioned that it can be affected during different times of the year. Right. Foliage without affect it. Like, you know, trees with leaves. Yes. And stuff? Yeah. Uh, I mean, foil, if metal is being hung in the building or some type of uh, something's changed in the building, some fabric that's metal, uh, you know, right. something's different. It can definitely affect the quality of service. Right. No, no. What I meant was I didn't, I didn't mean aluminum foil. I meant. Let's say I do two surveys, right? I do one survey in the middle of the summer. The trees have all kinds of leaves and stuff on, but then I do another one in the middle of winter because all the leaves are falling on the ground, right? Wouldn't that be so? You would get a different reading. Uh, right? It's I, it's possible. I work with the Parks Department in New York City. Uh, they never said anything about the leaves causing issues. They said more about water getting near water adjusts or affects the signal. Um, I don't know about leaves uh, on pine needles or maple leaves or whatever kind gotcha. it is water in there it, i would think it could block signal but i haven't had experience with that so after after the after the technician done their survey with uh with your scanner um what documentation would they give to the customer and what would be a good way to explain to the customer here's what you're looking because you know test results with regular testers Technicians can understand them pretty easily, but if you hand that to a customer, they don't understand the red line and the gap and all that other stuff. So, it, so it, what would be? Some it is a detailed report. It is a multi-page, multiple-page report, and you could have the, the, how you walk through it. That heat map will be on there. You could have topology on there. You could make it as detailed as you want, and, and that's all done on that link live page that we were looking at before. Um, it, you probably, it's not. They give it to just anyone. They're not going to understand it. So it's something that you could, you know, we have to talk to them about and show them what you found in the report and why you, you have to make more adjustments, tweak things, maybe get different antennas or add access points to it because they might not understand it. It's not as simple as pass fail, right? The one to engineer from Fluke said the uh, Wi-Fi is the Wild West. Uh, there is no standard. So we talk standards. We cable certifiers. I have a I have a cable certifier over there. That tests to a standard. Uh, when talking Wi-Fi, uh, the original Fluke engineers who actually still make this product, uh, and they work with NetAlly, um, they set up parameters here for pass fail uh, or warning warnings, let's say, and you can adjust them. But there is no standard with this stuff. There's recommendations on what you how you should be of what levels you should be at. So, um, you know, it, it's it's based on what the customer's trying to do. And it might take help, you know, if there's issues, we, we I could help explain a report or we can get net ally engineers to help explain a report. But, you know, um, it might not, you know, just giving to someone might be difficult for them to understand. Right, so, yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, because it's just like it's like the cable certification results. They can be kind of confusing to the, to the person who's not well versed in you know near and cross talking far and cross talking stuff but it does say but pass fail though 
It, you know. Yes. Yes. Keep it simple. Something. <laughs> I don't remember what the other S stands for. Right. But you're right. So that's what customers want to see. They want to see the the big green check or the big green pass. They don't want to see that X or 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 the fail and stuff like that. Right. right? So let me ask you a question about wireless access points because you, again, you're the wireless expert, not me. And I know this is probably going to vary by manufacturing by model, right? Generally speaking, for like a commercial office building, how much area does one access point cover? So an access point without any obstruction goes like 300 feet, right? If that's not, there's no 300 feet, unless you're in a big factory or something, right? We're in a building where, you know, my office or whatever, you have walls all over uh, and upstairs, you know. So, it, and again, it depends on the medium, how far that signal will go. So, and if you have a, a long range, I like the long range access points. It gives you more signal. Right, stronger signal. Uh, it depends again what access points you're deploying too. What makes it long range? Is, it, is that the the power? It is. That it's a stronger thing, or is it the antenna? The the uh, it is a stronger unit. The uh, the uh, charger, the uh, AC adapter for it is a much much more robust product. It gets hotter. Uh, it's definitely a more a, a beast compared to the older units that we were selling, and that they are out there. So yeah. So the reason I ask that question is because, again, you know, being a former estimator, I'm always crunching numbers in my head. It drives my wife crazy. We'll go to the movie theater, and I will count the ceiling tiles and figure out the square footage of the room. And then I'll count the number of seats in the room, and I'll divide the number of seats into I'm, – I'm OCD. I get it. I get it. But so the reason I ask that question is because I can see somebody new listening to this show wanting to know, okay, what's a good baseline to start at? So if if, if – if I got a floor plan that's ten thousand square feet, and you said on average, and I know I know that it depends on you know what all the stuff is around, but if it can serve three hundred square feet, that's going to give you at least a minimum number to start off with, right? You know, you probably gonna, you might need more if it's got you know if it's an industrial plan where you got a lot of steel, you might need more because it's got concrete walls, but at least it gives you a starting point. Yeah, right? yeah, it's the it's each building's unique, right? It depends when it was made, oh, made with brick brick and stone or it's made with just metal and sheetrock depends it's what each what 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 about because we talked about metal we talked about drip gypsum board yeah what about what kind of signal loss could we expect in a in a building that's wood stud and maybe has uh plywood instead of gypsum board is, it, is that gonna be the same kind of loss as a gypsum board or uh, it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be more close loss? it's gonna be a little bit more loss it's a little more denser material I think, um, but uh, okay, sheetrock's like 3 dB. But uh, I, like I'm trying to think back with the software when you when you do the theoretical software surveys, it actually has a list of all these materials in there, and so you can pick sheetrock. It's or that's 3 dB. If it's wood, it's something else. A metal door, it's something else. Um, what's interesting, you're able to on the software, not on this product, if it's not listed, some material, let's say, you can actually uh, add uh, a metal door, let's say. You could put an X point here, take a reading, and add that number, and then it'll have it as a default, let's say, the next time you do it. So you're able, with software, you're able to add values if it's not listed. So, I mean, it's, I'm always thinking about safety because I was a safety officer for many years, and I lost a, an uncle to a safety act on, on the job site act. So safety is always really close to my heart. And I know a lot of people are probably hearing this thinking, oh, this is pretty simple, pretty easy, but we always got to be thinking about safety. Is there any kind of special safety things that they may need to keep in the back of their head when they're going to go do a wireless service? So the only thing that comes to mind is when you're, you're, you're looking at this thing, you're walking through like a, a building like Costco or, you know, a big warehouse uh, and there's other machines running around you, uh, you know, maybe have a safety vest on, uh, nothing, you're not, you're not doing anything crazy. You're not climbing up into the um, up high or anything. You're just walking through the corridors and taking these readings. So just be aware of where you are and what's around you while you're doing it. And because I know you're looking here, you're hitting the circles. You didn't want to walk out in front of a forklift or something or a, a moving vehicle. If you're in a tarmac doing an airport, let's say. So just right. got to, you know, use common sense. And that makes sense too, because you want to measure it at the level where somebody's going to be interacting with the network. Right. So that makes, that makes absolute sense. Right. Absolute sense. So yeah, high visibility vest. Um, maybe even have a spotter if you can get the customer to, to pay extra. Yeah. Especially for like for like a busy environment, like like you said, like a Costco or something like that. You know, because we you know those people in, in shopping centers they're not paying attention to where they're oh, walking. And one other thing I just remembered. So the battery on these things are great. 
They're great batteries, but it might take you a few, a, more than a couple hours to get it done. So I would recommend having a battery backup. You, we, they sell, we have a, a part number. I don't know off the top of my head. It's like a battery you'd use to, for your laptop or your phone. And that could plug into the USB-C connection on the side here and charge this thing as you're going. So if you're, okay. you're going low on battery for whatever reason, you know, it's taking you longer just because you don't want to stop, you know, and then plug this in to get it charged. You want to keep going. So your battery, your battery is not, not a lot of money at all. How long does one battery charge last? So it should last, it should last about two to three hours, right? Two okay. to three hours, okay. but it might take you longer depending how big it is. So having right. a battery backup just to plug it in and give you more juice is definitely recommended. So going back, think about that, that brand new technician walking around this, doing his first wireless survey. What are some common challenges that that person may come encounter, may encounter? Well, you want to walk slow, right? You want to have the floor plan in here. You might not be able to get in rooms, which is fine. You can come back. So you can skip those rooms, do what you can, and come back when they're empty. But you want to be able to hit everything so you get a complete survey. Um, you know, you want to be walking in a, if you're in an office environment, uh, you know, again, people are like, what are you doing here? You know, you know you're know, doing a survey. They might not want to. Wear that vest. Wear that yellow vest. They won't ask. They what? They'll just assume you're there. Wear that yellow safety vest. They'll assume you belong yeah, there. Yeah, that's true. Um, being a little, so if they're using the product there. Maybe they're not, you know, they're not sure what they're doing. So they're a little uncomfortable with it. So, you know, we, they, let me actually, I didn't tell you this. They, they, the website is fantastic. There's lots of webinars and lots of it training videos on these types of products. Plus besides having, if you were to buy it from my company, Cable and Connections, we would train you so you know it really well. Uh, and lots of webinars on different uh, scenarios too, on doing industrial sites or, or other enterprise commercial sites oh. on there too. It's a very, very intense, make sure, very, they're, they're usually an make hour sure, long. They're very good and they're all free. Make sure you send me the links. Make sure you send me the links after we, after this, after this show. Okay. And I'll make sure I put those in the description and I, I want to watch them. Cause like I said, I'm okay with wireless. I'm not your wireless expert. Yeah. I'm, I'm a knuckle dragon cable guy, yeah. but uh, you know, yeah, I definitely want to watch those. And, and I get asked questions about wireless all the time. And I usually defer them to a subject matter expert, somebody you know like you, because yeah, you know, I don't do that day in and day out, right? It's, it's got an Android operating system. It's like using a phone, so it's very easy for everyone to use, and so many options and features in it, right? This is strictly right. wireless we're talking today, but there's also a wired and Wi-Fi version. You see, it's a little bit thicker, right? This does right. everything for an IT guy, right? For a networking guy, so. Um, it's they, it's just the breadth of product they have is really amazing. It's it's great product. Let, let me go back to the, the example that you gave a moment ago when you talked about, let's say you couldn't get into a room, right? Um, so this, for me, that tells me as a, as a, when I'm talking to the customer, let them know, look, I'm gonna need access to every area. So communicate to the customer, you need access to all these areas. So that way, if you have to get the keys or they have to make arrangements, you can get to them. But my question is, so let's say that I, I find one room that's locked for whatever reason. The, so, so the person that got the, the email or the memo just ignored it. They, they locked it because they went to lunch, right? So I'm doing my wire map everywhere else. And let's say I finish up in the southeast, southeast corner. Now I walk all the way back to that room, but I'm not testing all the way back. Does the mapping program know that I'm in that, in that spot? Or do I have to keep hitting the map till I work back to that room. So yeah, it does. there's no GPS in the building. It doesn't know where you are, right? Because there's, GPS doesn't work. So you got to tell it where you are as you're walking in that okay. environment. So uh, I would just say, keep, uh, you keep the survey running and just walk back and try to get to that room. That's be the best. I, I, it's a good question. So if you say you, you, you finished at the far end, can I just walk back and then scan that? You probably can. Um, you probably can, but it is nothing wrong with keeping it on, just scanning as you go back to. But it does save time if you're not doing that. You can just you can jog back right. there and 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 look at that and just take a scan of that room too, and add it. Right. So it those, probably won't so those, work. I I don't see why it wouldn't work. Gotcha. So those green circles that when you when you're hitting a button and it was it was scanning those frequencies right where you're standing. How big is that circle? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I want to say it's probably like 10, 15 feet at the most, oh, okay. right? And you, okay. and you're walking slow and after you hit it, you it, you're going to walk to the edge of the circle, wait till it turns green and then keep moving, right? 
And that's what's the delay, because it's scanning all these channels. It's, it doesn't scan a cha all the channels in just one second. It's going to take five or ten seconds at least to scan all the channels. Right? Gotcha. And that's why Perfect. it's going to take so long to cover a large building, because you got to walk very slow and, and take right. the scans. Because that, that could help on the estimating side as well, because if you know that it's every time you push that button, it's going to scan a 15 square foot or 15 circumference circle. Again, mathematically, you can calculate the square footage of the floor that you're working on divided by the, the number each scan can do, and that's going to tell you how many times you got to push that button. Right. And then you can you can assign a labor value to that. If you said fifteen seconds, I would probably do I would probably do one minute per push button. Yes, because that gives me time to do it. Yes, let it do its thing, and then walk slowly to the next spot. Yeah. so that could help me build up my estimate. Yes. I like that. that's pretty. Cool. Yeah, I trained when I was playing with this and got you know introduct introduced to this. I did my office right, and I learned how it worked that way. So anyone who would buy equipment like this, that's what I would tell them. You know, set up a floor plan in your office, your home. And then see how it is. You cover that whole floor and you get an idea how long it's going to take you. Right? Excellent. Excellent. Dan, what a great show, man. You're just a wealth of knowledge, man. Thank I appreciate you coming on today. I enjoy selling. I enjoy talking about these tools. I feel I've grown up with these tools, right? I help. I feel I helped develop them to some extent because I had the engineers come in. We went through all different uh, end users here uh, where I am in the Northeast. And uh, then they added more. They said what they liked and what they didn't like, and they added those features. So I felt, in a little way, I helped develop it. You have ownership. Yeah. You you have ownership. In a little there. way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.